Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cardiology Lectures. I am Dr. Nick Nickum, a practicing cardiologist at the Texas Medical Center, Houston, Texas for the past 30 years. And please do visit our YouTube channel where we have more than 80 presentations on cardiology lectures and we would like you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So let's continue with our feature presentation. Today we are going to look at uh, EKG diagnosis of uh, T wave abnormalities. We are also going to look at what are the conditions that can cause T wave abnormalities, how we differentiate the T wave changes that we see on the surface electrocardiogram based on the underlying pathophysiology and touch upon what are the things that we need to do to manage these patients uh, briefly. Before we go any further, I would like to review the normal T wave appearance on a 12 lead electrocardiogram. Here is a normal 12 lead electrocardiogram and generally the T waves should have a smooth upstroke and, and a smooth downstroke as we see here in lead 1, 2, ABL, V2 to V6. All these leads must have beautiful smooth upstroke and a downstroke except for A, V, R where the T wave may be inverted and also in V1 where the T wave may be slightly inverted. Whereas in lead 3, it is little different because the lead 3 could either have a flat T wave, upright T wave or an inverted T wave. However, when we see dramatic changes in the T waves, either generalized or localized, they signify underlying pathology and that is what we are trying to get to. Because I am a practicing cardiologist, I apply all these tests to see how best it can help me to understand what is the underlying pathophysiology, what is the abnormality and how do I fix those abnormalities to make the patient feel better. So that should be the clinical approach to dealing with the T wave abnormalities on the surface electrocardiogram. There are three main categories under which we can see T wave abnormalities. The first one is of course going to be the inverted T waves which are the most common ones. The second one which is the most dramatic and acute in onset relates to tall T waves and we are going to look at all differential diagnosis under each one of these categories. And the third one which is sort of uh, less severe and uh, something that can wait that is uh, related to minor changes in, in the metabolism things like that they are flat T waves or biphasic T waves or min minor T wave changes. These are the three main categories of abnormalities we see in T wave morphology on the surface electrocardiogram. Move further. If we go any further, we need to understand what does the T wave represent? What is causing the, the formation of the T wave? If we understand that one, it helps us to get a better understanding of why we are seeing T wave changes to begin with under certain pathological conditions. So here we need to go back to the ionic level at the electron microscopic level of the myo myocytes and as here are the myocytes and here is the interstitial space myocytes to understand what is going on to cause the T wave to begin with. I am talking about the normal T wave and from there we are going to go and see why are we seeing abnormalities and if we are seeing abnormalities what is causing them and how do we fix them. Okay, here is the action potential. I did an extensive presentation on myocyte and sinus node action potentials. Uh, I am going to put a link to that one at the end of this uh, presentation and please do visit that video and watch it to get a comprehensive understanding of what action potential is. I am just going to just run through quickly to get to the T waves so we can continue with the, the T wave abnormalities presentation. Here is an action potential uh, in the sinus node and in the atrium and the AB node and this is the ventricular action potential which we are interested in. As you know, the action potential has the phase, the resting phase, then the active de depolarization phase, 
then there's a plateau and there is the repolarization phase. You can see from the surface electrocardiogram, the, the depolarization represent, is represented by the QRS complex, whereas the slow gradual repolarization is represented by the T wave. And that's why we say T wave is representing the left ventricular repolarization or ventricular repolarization. You may be saying, why ventricular repolarization? Why aren't we seeing the atrial repolarization? Well, if we do see atrial repolarization, it won't be at this time interval. It will should be somewhere in the PR interval. But the voltage is so small, it is sort of buried in the PR segment itself. That's why you are not seeing the atrial repolarization. Because the Q ventricles have a much wider Q or QRS complex, we see the repolarization represented by the T waves. If you look at the ionic level here and during the phase of repolarization, you see here and we have the potassium going out during the early phase which causes the membrane potential to drop. But during repolarization, there is uh, efflux or the movement of potassium from inside the cell to the outside while the calcium comes inside the cell. So all the changes related to the repolarization phase are due to changes in the calcium and potassium ions inside the myocyte. That explains why some of the conditions where during ischemia, we see certain movement of ions inside and outside the cells. Similarly, in patients with renal failure and hyperkalemia, where is excess potassium in the interstitial space, these are the elements that are causing the changes in the T wave. That is uh, getting back to too much basics. Let's move on to the next slide here. Now we're going to start off with the first segment which I talked about. T wave inversion. Within the T wave inversion segment, we have two major categories. The T wave inversion could be either localized T wave inversion or it could be generalized T wave inversion. So, let us look at localized T wave inversion situations. The most common causes for localized that look when I am talking about localized, I am referring to the T wave changes that are localized to one region of the myocardium like the anterior wall, the lateral wall or the inferior wall. So that is how they are. So if we see localized T wave inversion which is like in this case the left Burnley branch block, we are seeing ST depression and T wave inversion in the leads that represent the left ventricle namely 1 AVL and from V4 to V6. So that is one condition where we are going to see lo localized T wave inversion relating mostly to the left ventricle in this case. And similarly same situation where we see T wave inversion with down sloping ST segment in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. The third condition where we are going to see localized T wave inversion would be a patient with right bundle branch block. As you can see, we have a right bundle branch block associated with a T wave inversion in V1, V2, V3. So that is another condition because if you look at the lateral leads, the T waves, the T waves are upright. Or one more condition is ischemia. A localized ischemia in the anterior wall can give rise to T wave inversion V1 to V4. A, a T wave inversion from V1 to V4 could represent anterior wall ischemia. It could also represent pulmonary embolus if it is associated with the right ventricular pressure overload or prominent R waves in the right side of the chest. And this is uh, this is a special condition when we see symmetrically inverted T waves in V1 to V3 uh, which may represent uh, what is known as uh, the Wellens syndrome which is suggesting anterior ischemia. There are two types of anterior ischemia we need to be familiar with. One where we have a, like a V1 here, one like where we have a V1, V wave here uh, and a smoothly inverted T wave or uh, you could have a R starting with and this is type 1 there or we can have 
a biphasic a biphasic T wave. Similarly, if a patient comes with chest pain and you see T wave changes localized to the inferior wall, that may suggest localized inferior wall ischemia. If it is associated with positive enzymes, it may represent non-Q myocardial infarction involving the inferior wall. Let's move on and look at generalized T wave change. The two most common conditions where we see generalized T wave inversion are ischemia, myocardial ischemia and cerebrovascular accident. Let's first talk about myocardial ischemia. In a patient with significant triple vessel disease who comes in with low blood pressure, something like that, we can see generalized T wave inversions in multiple leads and that is suggestive of ventricular ischemia. That's a more ominous sign because we are looking at this global ischemia which may be related to anemia, hypoxia or severe chronic lung disease where the oxygen level is pretty low. So that's an indication and if it is associated with enzymes, obviously the condition is much more serious and they need to be evaluated with cardiac catheterization and, and possible coronary intervention. Now let's talk about what are called as the giant negative T waves. This type of T waves you may see a couple of times in your uh, career. I've been in practice for almost 40 years. I have seen maybe two or three times this type of T wave inversion and this usually represents massive cerebrovascular accident. People with major strokes present with giant negative T waves. So these are the two main categories of T wave inversions. Now let's switch over to tall T waves. Tall T waves are a totally different pathophysiology altogether. I'm going to start off by showing that I showed you the normal T waves to begin with and here as you can see there are tall peaked T waves here and along with some ST segment elevation. Before we go into differentiating what causes tall T waves, let's look at uh, some of the things that may cause tall T waves. When I was talking about the action potential, I told you the ions that are involved in the repolarization phase, which is uh, this segment, are calcium and potassium. So, basically, when there is excess potassium, when there is excess potassium in the interstitial space, it may interfere, it may interfere with the potassium exchange that can lead to T wave changes. Here is a, a representation of the potassium levels and corresponding electrocardiographic changes. When the potassium level is low, we're going to see flat to small diminutive T waves. As uh, the potassium level goes down and down, we're going to see ST depression. However, if the potassium level keeps building up, as it goes from 6.5 to 7, all of a sudden we begin to see slurring of the QRS complex. You look at this QRS complex versus this QRS complex. This widening of the QRS complex, slurring of the S QRS complex along with the T wave elevation. When the potassium level reaches 8 and 9, then we have a wide QRS complex with the smooth round borders with tall, sometimes very tall uh, T waves representing hyperkalemia. With this, okay, let's look at the differential diagnosis of uh, tall peaked T waves. We can see tall peaked T waves in patients with uh, acute myocardial infarction. In, in a situation where there is lifting of the ST segment from the baseline along with shifting of the T waves beyond the baseline, creating an impression of a ST segment blending almost imperceptibly into the upstroke of the T waves. So this is classic of a hyper acute phase of a, an acute myocardial infarction. And as you can see, most of them are localized to certain region of the coronary anatomy. And here, this is related to the anterior wall and high anterior wall. 
and this could be a proximal left anterior descending artery because it involves the high anterior wall which is supplied by the diagonal branch then we have the anterior wall and also some of the lateral wall which is supplied by the distal diagonal branches. So, this is a pretty extensive myocardial infarction where we are seeing these T wave changes. The other condition where we see most commonly tall peaked T waves is uh, hyperkalemia, chronic renal failure patients, hormone dialysis. For some reason, they skip the dialysis or they don't take the medications they come back with hyperkalemia potassium in the range of six seven eight milli equivalents per deciliter and that's when you see these tall peaked t waves an interesting aspect to differentiate this from an acute myocardial infarction is the fact that the st segments are isoelectric they are at the baseline and that is an important differentiating point and also if you look at the T waves, the T waves are much narrower compared to the combination of ST segment and T waves which here they look like tombstone T waves whereas these they just look like daggers or sharp knives. These are some other subtle changes that can help us to differentiate tall T waves as a result of an acute myocardial infarction versus uh, acute hyperkalemia. Now, let us look at the third category of uh, T wave changes which involves flat T waves, biphasic T waves or non-specific STT changes. Flat T waves represent hypokalemia or they, they could represent uh, hypothyroidism. Whenever you see a patient with low QRS voltage like we are seeing here along with flat T waves, you should always think about hypothyroidism. You could also see that in large pericardial effusions or even pleural effusions. The second condition is the, the biphasic T wave which we talked about and if you see this in the anterior leads like V1, V2, V3, we are talking about uh, ischemia. And the non-specific T waves, they just don't tell you anything, you know, it's, it is not normal it's just there, it doesn't signify any major underlying pathology. So, ladies and gentlemen, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching our cardiology lectures and please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and also bookmark our cardiology lectures where we have more than, more than 80 videos covering various topics in the field of cardiology. If you would like to hear a presentation on a particular topic of interest to you, please drop us a message there and we will be happy to do the research and create a video presentation for you and also for many other YouTube watchers. Thank you so much. I am Dr. Nick Nickham and we will see you next time.